Hello and welcome to Beat the Nation GCSE Higher Week 5 with me, Mr. Barton. Now, what is Beat the Nation? Well, thousands of students across the country have been sitting quizzes, online quizzes, on my Diagnostic Questions website. And I've gone into one of these quizzes and I've chosen three questions. And they're the three questions that you can see in front of you now. But these aren't any old three questions. Oh no, I've chosen the three worst answered questions from that quiz. And I'm going to set you five challenges. So challenge number one, can you get each of these three questions correct? And then what I want you to do is I want you to think hard about what you reckon the worst answered question is from these three. And then can you go through each question and decide what do you think the most popular choice of wrong answer is? And then why might a student believe that wrong answer to be right? And then the fifth challenge I think is the hardest. Imagine you were sat next to one of these students who is convinced that one of these wrong answers is right. How would you convince them that in fact they're wrong, in a nice way of course, and that you're right? So what I suggest you do is you pause this video, you work your way slowly through these three questions, bearing my five challenges in mind, and then when you're ready, unpause this video and we'll go through them together. Good luck. Okay, have you got your answers? Nice one. Right, let's go through these. And to add a bit of drama, let's go through these in reverse order. So I'm going to show you the least worst answered of these three questions first. And it is this one here. What is the gradient between these two points? Now, let me give you a piece of advice here, and I'm sure you know this already. Anytime any question mentions anything about coordinates, it's always worth just doing a very quick sketch just to get a bit of a sense of where you're up to. So I've got my Y axis there and I've got my X axis there. So let's mark these coordinates on. So I've got three, four. So that's three across the X and four up the Y. Now notice I'm not spending any time doing this accurately or anything like that. I just want this roughly marked on so I get a bit of a sense of this. Next up, I'm going to go for minus one, one. So I'm going to go negative one across the X and one up the Y. So I'm going to mark that on there, negative one, one there. And now the question said, what is the gradient? So the gradient is all about the slope of this line. So how do I work out the slope? Well, a good way to think about this is that the gradient is how far you change, and that triangle is just a posh way of saying change, how far you change in your Y divided by how far you change in your X. In other words, how far you change going up or down divided by how far you change going right or left. Now, because we've marked this on here, we, it's quite easy for us to get a bit of a sense of this because if I just draw a little dotted line across here, that's gonna help us figure out how far across we go. And if I draw a little dotted line here, that's gonna help us work out how far up and down we go. Now, I don't have to have drawn this accurately or measured out squares or anything like that because I can just count. So if we do our across first, so let's just get my little uh, fraction ready to go here. Let's do our across first. So I start off on negative one here. So that value there is negative one. And I go right across to an X value of three. So what does, what does that mean? That length needs to be to go from negative one to three. I think that means that's got a length of four. Negative one all the way to three has a length of four. So that bottom of my fraction there is going to be four. And um, let's work out the height. So I start on a Y value of one here and I go up to a Y value of four there. So how far have I gone from one to four? Well, I think the difference between one and four is three. So I've gone up three. So my gradient is my change in Y, which is three divided by my change in X, which is four. The only other thing I just need to check is that it's not negative three over four. Well, I can see that my gradient is sloping upwards from left to right, which is a positive gradient. So my answer is going to be positive. So I'm going to go for a correct answer for this of B, three quarters. Let's see if I'm right. Yes, I am luckily, but look at that. Only 56% of students agree with me that that's the correct answer. The most popular choice of uh, wrong answer is C, 28%. And that student's thinking the answer's four over three. Now that's close. We got three over four. They've gone for four over three. Why might they think that? I'm sure you can predict this. Look at that. Goes across four on the X and up three on the Y. Absolutely perfect. But they've done the division the wrong way around. It's change in Y divided by change in X. Okay, how did you get on with that one? Don't worry if you struggled, a tricky question. Um, let's now look at the second worst answered question. And it is 
this one here. Okay, I like this one, I must admit. Uh, the graph shows Joe's bike ride. How fast, now that's going to be important. Let's get a little bit of a box around that. How fast was Joe traveling on section B to C? Let's look at B to C. So um, we've got a graph here. We've got distance going up here and we've got time going across here. So we're at point B. Joe had already traveled two miles. Okay, that's important. And then by the time he gets to point C, you can see across there that he's traveled five miles. So between points B and C, Joe's traveled three miles. Now, I'm tempted there to say the answer's three miles an hour, but wait a minute, how long's it actually taken? If it took Joe an hour, then fine, he's traveled three miles in an hour, but has he? Well, he's gone across one square in terms of time. Let's look at our scale here. There's 11 o'clock, there's 12 o'clock. How many squares in between them? One, two, three, four. So actually one square doesn't mean an hour. One square's 15 minutes or a quarter of an hour. So Joe has traveled three miles in a quarter of an hour. So how far does that mean he could travel in an hour? Because we can work that out. We've got miles per hour. Well, we could do a fancy division. We could start thinking about our oh, speed, distance, time, and all that kind of thing. And that's certainly going to work. But it's often worth just applying a bit of logic here. If you can travel three miles in half an hour, I think that means he can travel six miles. Sorry, three miles in a quarter of an hour. I think that means he can travel six miles in half an hour which I think means he can travel 12 miles in one full hour. Can you see that? Does that make sense? Three miles in a quarter of an hour. So if you double the miles, you've got to double the amount of time it takes. And then if you double the miles again, you double the amount of time it takes. So I think that Joe is traveling at 12 miles per hour. I think the correct answer to that is D. Now notice to get that, we first had to carefully work out how far Joe had gone and then carefully work out how long it had taken him and scale that up to get that into units that we're happy with, miles per hour. So I think the correct answer is D. We've got it right, that's good news, but look at that, only 53% of students agree with us. C is the most popular choice of wrong answer, three miles an hour. Now, where's three miles an hour come from? Well, we kind of covered that when we were discussing it. He moves three boxes. This is a real-life student explanation. He moves three boxes, and the box and the boxes and one box represent one kilometer. Now, a couple of issues here. There's no mention of kilometers. We're talking miles, but we can see what this student's done, right? Got the right idea that he travels three boxes, so got the right idea of three miles, but has made the mistake in thinking that that time there is one hour, when we know it's certainly not one hour, it's a quarter of an hour. Okay, how did you get on with that one? Another tricky one there. Um, which brings us to the final question. The worst answer of all those three. It is this question here. Did you predict that this one would be the worst answered question? Do you think you've got this one right? Let's have a look at this one. A plane flies at an equal distance between two control towers. Now, what I'm going to do, I don't know any other information about where these control towers are, so I'm just going to bang them here. Um, the locus of the plane is, so the locus, this is all about all your compass, constructions, the pencils, the rulers, all that kind of thing. So all we know is that a plane flies in an equal distance between these control towers. So one point we know this plane's gonna fly through is there, exactly halfway in between, using my uh, dodgy diagram. But that's not the only point, because there are lots of other points. In fact, there's an infinite amount of points that are equidistant between these two towers. For example, can you see how that point there is possibly the same distance from there as it is from there and also that point there is the same distance as it is there from there and i can keep doing this there's thousands and millions of these points here that are the exact same distance from that tower as they are from that tower and i can repeat the same thing going the other way around so if the plane flies along this path and this will be bad without a ruler oh, actually that's not too bad if the plane plane flies along this path at every single point it will always be the exact same distance between these two control towers. So the question is, what's that construction called? Well, this is something you've got to know. Um, you've, you've got to just learn this, unfortunately. That if you want um, to find out all the points that are the exact same distance between two other points, this is when you need something that's called the perpendicular bisector. Now, a good way to remember this is there's two, two parts of perpendicular bisector that are important. Bisector means you chop in half. So can you see here, we started, we've sliced this in half. There's the bisect. And perpendicular means that it, it's at a right angle to this path that's in between them. So if I just mark on this path between the uh, two 
towers, that angle there is a right angle between. So the perpendicular bisector splits the distance in half and then it gets a line that travels at a right angle to the original path between the two control towers. And so I think A is the correct answer to this. It's worth just having a look at B, C, and D just to make just to see what the other ones are, just to make sure we're, we're right here. The shaded region between the two towers. So that's all to do with if, if you want shaded regions, that's the kind of questions that says mark all the points that are exactly, let's say, three centimeters from a point, and that's where you end up with a circle <laughs> that's around there, and you shade it in and Every single point there is within three centimeters um, of that tower. But that's not what the question is asking. Two circles with centers drawn from each of the tower. Again, circles, circles are important. Circles help us draw perpendicular bisectors, but it's not what this question is asking. We need to go one step further and construct this line. Angle bisector. Angle bisector is close, you know. Angle bisector does something really important. If we had a tower there, and we had a tower there, and we had an angle there and we chopped up that uh, that angle into half and we ended up with our angle bisector then we do get something here we do get something that's equidistant but it's not equidistant between those two points angle bisectors find us things that are equidistant between two lines so say for example we had a road here and a road there and we wanted to find the distance that's um, exactly the same between those two roads, that's when um, angle bisectors come into play. But if we want the same uh, equidistant between two points, that's when we need this perpendicular bisector. So after all that explanation, um, I reckon the correct answer to this is A. It'd be annoying now if I'm wrong. Pfft, lucky I'm right, but look at that. Only 50% of students got it uh, right. Just as many students got this wrong, and indeed the wrong answers are pretty evenly split, but C just about takes it. Two circles with centers drawn from each of the towers. If you read that, um, if the centers of both circles um, is the center of each tower, place in the middle, you could measure the distance and see if they both end um, right where the plane is. This is almost, I mean, it's not completely wrong. It's almost like a bit of a, oh God, what am I doing there with that? It's almost like a bit of a trial, improve, trial and improvement technique. You draw a circle there, you draw a circle there, and what you're looking for is where these two circles intersect to get equidistant. And in fact, if you keep doing that and you find this point of intersection, that is actually one way to construct this perpendicular bisector. But the question's asked, what is what is the locus of this plane? Well, what are all those points called where they are equidistant? And the answer to that is perpendicular bisector. Wow, okay, these are hard, these questions. Hey, how did you get on with those three? Don't worry if you struggled, as we've seen thousands of students have also struggled with, with these questions. But if we can confront them and think hard about them, hopefully we're on the path to understanding them. Um, if that's what your appetite for more, you can try out um, 20 of these quizzes if you head to my diagnosticquestions.com website and go to forward slash revision 2019. Uh, you'll be able to access these quizzes. And if you're a teacher watching this and you want to set these quizzes uh, for your students, all completely for free, if you head to ed.co.uk and find the revision schemes of work, you'll find these quizzes here. And if you want to get your uh, students up on the platform, on the system, so they can answer them on their own devices and it's marked automatically and so on, if you drop an email to hello at ed.co.uk, um, attaching a spreadsheet with your uh, students' names and their class, co class names on there, one of our team will sort that out for you. And, and that's all completely free. Anyway, hope you found that useful and I'll be back with another Beat the Nation in the future. Take care and bye for now.